Please be seated. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the 28th Remembrance Ceremony. Thank you to the Oklahoma City Fire, Pipes and Drums, who led our procession. I'm John Kennedy, the chair of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Foundation. We are grateful you are here, coming together as a community. Thank you to those who are joining us online from around the country. As you can see, the weather moved us inside again this year. We do live in Oklahoma. Between the wind and some forecasted drizzle, we thought it would be best for us to all make this move inside. And we are so grateful to our neighbors at First Church for 28 years now. They have opened their doors numerous times and let us hold important ceremonies in this sanctuary, which was built as a result of the damage done to this historic land-run church. Thank you, Pastor Chris Dodson and your congregation for your wonderful hospitality and for all you do for us. Thank you. We are pleased to have several special guests with us today. Please hold your applause. Stephen Dettelbach, ATF Director. Jason Shelton, GSA Regional Administrator. Roy Hawkins, Senior Executive and Director of the Central Region Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Damon Y. Smith, the General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Gail E. Bowling, the Deputy General Counsel for Operations. Amy L. Brown, Deputy uh, General Counsel for Housing Programs. Kevin McNeely, General Deputy Assistant Secretary, Office of Administration. Governor Kevin Stitt and First Lady Sarah Stitt. Attorney General Gintner Drummond. <coughs> Mayor David Holt. Councilperson Bradley Carter, Councilperson James Cooper, Councilperson Nikki Nice, Governor Anna Tubby, members of our State House and Senate and City Manager Craig Freeman, former Governor Frank Keating, Dr. Susan Chambers, Vice Chair of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Foundation, and our Board of Trustees. Let's please welcome these guests. Let us express our appreciation to Carrie Watkins and the amazing staff of the Memorial and Museum. She is the most thoughtful person I know and has the hardest working team imaginable. Let us recognize Carrie Watkins and the team. And importantly, our family members, survivors, first responders, law enforcement, and friends of those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever on April 19, 1995. Please join in recognizing our special guests. We come here today to remember the sacred ground of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum has helped heal us. It has served as a beacon of hope and proof of our shared resilience. It is on this sacred ground that we continue to work to find common ground. Those we honor today serve as our inspiration as to why it is vital to continue teaching the world our story. Teaching and remembering go hand in hand. We don't believe you should remember without trying to teach these important moments in history, and you shouldn't teach without remembering. Every visitor to the museum, the memorial grounds, and the museum, or benefactor of the outreach program, is changed by what they learn. This is not an event that just happened one moment in time. Its impact is felt for a lifetime. And it is up to each of us to share this ever-relevant story of hope and resilience. 
Our Memorial Conscience Committee, composed of family members, survivors, and first responders, serve to ensure that the memorial mission is clearly implemented through our policies, programs, and events. We thank our Conscience Committee for their service and welcome those who join us today. Let's please recognize them. Thank you. The preamble of the memorial mission statement can be found on the exterior of the Gates of Time and on the Museum Overlook. Our mission statement remains our cornerstone in shaping the important work that continues today. Reading our mission statement is Cindy Farrell Ashwood, sister of Susan Farrell, who was killed on April 19th. We come here to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. May all who leave here know the impact of violence. May this memorial offer comfort, strength, peace, hope, and serenity. Please join me in 168 seconds of silence. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> God, as we come together from different backgrounds, we are united in the hope that the worst thing is never the last thing. We are thankful for the hope that we have in you. We thank and praise you for who you are and what you do for us each and every day, more than we could ever repay. 
Help us to live in such a way as to be worthy of your sacrifice. We gather on the anniversary of tragedy, and we remember in the days, months, and years following the bombing, your hand continuing to work in various and miraculous ways. We continue to see people move to tears who have no connection, because in our hearts we know that this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not how we are supposed to treat each other. We shake our heads and ask, how can this happen? How can someone be so cruel? And yet we realize that we, in our own ways, have the capacity for sin. We harbor anger and hate towards others. Help us to be a people of forgiveness. We gather here because someone could not find it in their heart to forgive. They allowed a grudge to fester and grow and become hate. Let us not fall into the same trap. Help us to be a people of forgiveness. God, we know this is why over and over again you stress the importance of forgiveness and love. Help us to be a people of forgiveness. For the big things that have been done to us or to others that we find it difficult or impossible to forgive, help us to be a people of forgiveness. For the little things that we find hard to forgive, like that person who cut me off this morning in traffic, help us to be a people of forgiveness. In your word it says there is no fear in love and yet we let the fear of others overcome us. Help us to be a people of forgiveness. We gather here, remember and shout never again Never again begins with us and our choice to forgive. Help us to be a people of forgiveness. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Reverend Fields is the son of Carol Fields, who was killed on April 19th. He serves as the senior minister of First Christian Church of Guthrie. Reverend Fields, thank you for joining us today. That was beautiful. Our first responders played a vital role on this day 28 years ago and the days and months following the bombing. We are honored they are part of the ceremony today. Please stand for the presentation of colors by the combined honor guard from the Oklahoma City Police and Fire Departments and IMSA and the playing of our national anthem by the brass players of the Oklahoma City Philharmonic.
Please be seated. Thank you to the brass players of the Oklahoma City Philharmonic and to our combined color guard. Thank you. The Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum continues to be recognized as a global thought leader on healing, strength, resilience, and growth in the wake of tragedy and ready to help those looking to put their lives and communities back together. Today, we are joined by Tammy Sinclair, architect from El Progreso Memorial Library in Uvalde, Texas. Thank you for coming. People around the country and internationally turn to Oklahoma City in time of need, and we are honored to share our lessons learned. We have a presence during tragedies through social media or sending stakeholders to help or helping as they begin to memorialize. We are there. Joining us on this journey is the mayor of Oklahoma City, a member of the Memorial Board of Trustees, and a leader who is truly gifted at bringing people together. Please welcome Mayor David Holt. Thank you. As always, when we gather on this date, it is my solemn obligation to deliver, on behalf of the people of Oklahoma City, our deepest condolences to those who lost so much on April 19, 1995, recognizing that this state will always resurrect grief that defies the passage of time. And as always, on behalf of the people of Oklahoma City, I wish to express our gratitude to those who came to our aid from within and without our city. The first responders and rescuers who came from across the country will always be remembered and appreciated in Oklahoma City and especially on this day. 28 years after the act and 23 years since the dedication of the memorial, allow me also to express gratitude to the generation of people in this city who planted seeds in the dark days that followed this horrific act. They gazed up at the charred survivor tree and recognized that it is always our obligation to plant trees so that our grandchildren have shade. The perspective of time allows us to now fully see their legacy. The brave people who worked through their grief and shock in the wake of the bombing to build the memorial and museum did so with the clear intent of creating something that would last. The full realization of their vision is now undeniable. In 2023, this memorial is still a place that draws nearly every visitor to our city, including the second gentleman of the United States just two weeks ago. People come here to honor those who died and to contemplate the impact of dehumanization and violence. Every hour of every day on this sacred ground, hearts are touched in impactful ways. In 2023, this annual ceremony still draws us together, and its power has not diminished. In fact, it seems to grow every year. Our entire city seems to pause each April 19th to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. And we listen, in a way people rarely do anymore, to the important words of people like Justice Stephen Taylor. Tragedy and fate brought Justice Taylor and this city together in ways that were otherwise unlikely to occur, and we have been so much better for it. He is truly one of the great men of our time, an embodiment and protector of this nation's ideals, and we are so blessed to know him and call him friend. In 2023, the museum still teaches us important lessons that we need to hear. Programming like the Better Conversations series reminds us that our pain was originally born from the rejection of dialogue, a refusal to use the tools of democracy and the absurd embrace of dehumanization. 
This museum's better conversations serve to create a legacy of peaceful engagement, where our shared humanity is paramount and violence becomes unthinkable. These conversations have drawn global attention. Meanwhile, the museum works to carry the lessons of this event to new generations. Since we last gathered here, the museum debuted a video and curriculum for young people in elementary and middle school. My two children, George and Maggie, host a video for kids their own age, communicating what happened here and what we can learn from it. You can watch this video online and share it with young people in your life. In 2023, secondary traditions have grown that we never could have imagined in the darkest days of 1995. The annual marathon brings a welcome element of joy and triumph, reminding us that darkness can and must be answered with light. Smiles, sweaty hugs, and high fives will fill the streets around this memorial next weekend. And we will be reminded that the thing we are most proud of in Oklahoma City is the way we responded to this horror with grace and positive action and the Oklahoma standard. And per perhaps the most important enduring legacy given to us by the generation of 1995 is our city's very ethos, which requires constant cultivation, but nevertheless now permeates our local political culture. Here in Oklahoma City, perhaps uniquely, we work every day to embrace pluralism, the idea that many different perspectives and values can coexist. This is a founding principle of this democratic experiment we call America, and nothing of consequence has ever been accomplished without it. We cannot stamp out those with whom we disagree. We must put in the hard work of finding common ground, of compromising, and reaching an, a, an outcome that may not be our ideal, but that we can both accept. We will then move forward together, still holding our individual principles, but recognizing that our neighbor has a right to theirs as well. Pluralism is vital, and it is celebrated in Oklahoma City. Initiatives like MAPS are perfect distillations of the idea that a community's outcomes can and must represent many worldviews and perspectives. More than ever, our country needs that example, and more than ever, people are coming to Oklahoma City to find it. This, too, is a legacy of what happened here in 1995, and we must hold fast to it. And so, on this 28th anniversary, I grieve with you once again but I also celebrate the response that served as an example to the world and still does. The generation that responded in 1995 has left us enduring legacies. We are grateful for them, and it remains our obligation to build upon them. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Holt. That was wonderful. The West Gate represents 9.03 a.m., the moment we were changed forever, and the hope that came from the horror in the moments and days following the bombing. Oklahomans continue to show the nation and the world that when a community stands together, no obstacle is too great. Resolute in the belief that we are stronger together this is a lesson the people of our state must never forget. Our governor, Kevin Stitt, and First Lady Sarah Stitt are raising six children in Oklahoma. He stepped away from a successful business that created numerous jobs to now serve in public office. He lives a life of giving. Please welcome Governor Kevin Stitt. Oklahomans, it is with deep respect and reverence that we humbly gather here today on this sacred, sacred ground to remember the lives lost here 28 years ago today. On this April morning in 1995, Oklahomans woke up not knowing the fabric of our state would be changed forever. People dropped their kids off at school, they rushed to work, 
They said goodbye to their loved ones, unaware of the tragedy that day would bring. Each of us remembers where we were when we heard the news, whether it was a frantic phone call from a family member, reporting on the news, or the heartbreaking reality of firsthand experience. Each of us carries with us a unique experience and understanding of what happened that day. But no matter the experience, Oklahomans were changed forever. I was a senior at Oklahoma State at a friend's house when I saw it, started seeing the news on TV and then talked to my dad who was a pastor in Norman and found out that several people that we knew that went to church with uh, were there in the building. When our state faced the most unthinkable tragedy, we came together as one state and one community. The world turned to Oklahoma during our darkest hour and in our deepest mourning. And we showed our strength. We showed resiliency, community, and courage. We showed the world the Oklahoma standard. That legacy continues to live on in this city and in each of us that calls this state our home. As we remember this day, may, may we ask May, my, may, may my ask of you be this, continue to tell this story, continue to tell Oklahomans, the next generation, we must uphold our state's legacy and teach each passing generation what this day and this sacred ground means to our state and our nation. This day 28 years ago, Oklahoma saw the purest form of evil, the purest form of hatred. Innocent lives were destroyed. Families were torn apart. For Oklahoma, this evil and its impact forced us to make a choice between two different paths. One was paved with anger and bitterness and hatred. The other was paved with kindness, community, and faith. Faith in each other and in God. That's the path we chose. And it is the path we choose we continue to choose every single day in remembrance of those who this memorial stands to honor. Those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever on April 19th, 1995. May we never forget them, and may we always continue to show the world the Oklahoma standard. God bless you, and may God continue to bless the great state of Oklahoma. Thank you, Governor and Mrs. Stitt, for all the good you do. We appreciate you. Uh, we thank Mayor Holt for running with his daughter in the kids' marathon next weekend. <laughs> Last year, I pointed out that he is one foot taller than anyone else in the kids' marathon. <laughs> and we thank Governor Stitt for running in the Governor's Relay Challenge. I've been down here early in the morning and watched him practice. He is ready. Uh, thank you both for running to remember. Our keynote speaker is a proud Marine who served as a district judge for 21 years. He presided over more than 500 jury trials, including the state trial of the Oklahoma City bombing case. He promised a fair trial and said if there was not going to be a fair trial, there would be no trial. His goal was to conduct a trial that did not result in appeal, and he was successful. In 2004, Judge Taylor was named to the Supreme Court of Oklahoma and served as its Chief Justice from 2011 to 2013. During the centennial year, Oklahoma Magazine named Justice Taylor as one of the 100 who shaped us, a, living, a list of living and past Oklahomans who influenced the first 100 years of our state. Governor Stitt appointed him to serve on the state regents for higher education. He is the past chair of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Foundation and current member of the Board of Trustees Executive Committee. For many Oklahomans, Justice Taylor remains the face of justice in our state. 
sharing his thoughts on how the justice system rose to the challenge created by the bombing. Please welcome Justice Stephen Taylor. Once a year on this day, on that hallowed and sacred place, we gather to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. And may we all leave here knowing the impact of violence and that we find comfort, strength, peace, hope, and serenity especially the families of those killed and the survivors of that day. As I walked among the 168 chairs this morning, I thought about my intention to speak today about two obligations, two debts that we owe to those 168 lost lives. May their memory be a blessing. The first obligation owed was best defined on this day 28 years ago by a group of heroic first responders when they spray painted words on the wall of the corner of the building just past the survivor tree. Hear those words now. We search for the truth. We seek justice. The courts require it. The victims cry for it. And God demands it. We seek the truth. That was the first mission. Find those who committed this crime. That mission was accomplished in its most final form, through a criminal investigation and onto the courts. We seek justice. Justice. It was our obligation to bring justice to this horrible event. There was an historic investigation by multiple law enforcement agencies. And then the courts became involved. And as those words read, the courts require it, and the victims cry for it. Federal Judge Richard Mache presided over the trials of the eight federal officers who were killed. Justice was done. And then I had the responsibility to preside in state court over the 160 counts of murder of the 160 civilians who were killed. Justice was done. We all know the motive for this crime. It was the hatred that those two defendants had for our government. At the time of sentencing, I looked straight at the defendant and told him that it was ironic that the Constitution he hated so much was the Constitution that was strong enough and good enough to give him a fair trial. And that is the essence of justice, a fair trial and the full measure of the rule of law for everyone, even those defendants. That is the hallmark of our judicial system, and it is the obligation we owed to those 168. Justice was demanded, and justice was delivered, and the rule of law prevailed. We met that obligation to the 168, but today we must renew that duty to ourselves and to our children for the future. We must never allow our country to waver from the rule of law. I'm reminded of the words of Harriet Tubman, a woman who risked her life to bring the enslaved in the South 
along the Underground Railroad to freedom in the North. And on that path to freedom and justice, Harriet Tubman had these words for those escaping to the North. If you hear the dogs barking, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. And those words ring true today. If you love justice, keep going. If you respect the rule of law, if you seek justice, don't ever stop, keep going. Don't ever stop in your love of freedom. My personal standard is simple. Do right, fear not. Do right, fear not. The second obligation, the debt that we owe to those 168 is to carry on with one of the missions of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum, to teach and practice nonviolence and to work toward better conversations in our daily lives. Some call it civility. Never forget that these 168 were the victims of hate and violence and domestic terrorism. As a nation, we find ourselves divided on most every subject, right versus left, Democrat versus Republican, MSNBC versus Fox, urban versus rural. It has become 50% versus 50%. And I remind us that Abraham Lincoln said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And his words have great relevance and meaning today. Remember, we are the United States of America. And it seems that anger has become more pervasive than optimism. Compromise was a basis for our country's founding and continued strength. And today, compromise has become a bad word. We have forgotten how to disagree with one another. Remember the words of the book of Micah. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly. Let us resolve today to leave this sacred, hallowed ground with the words of Micah as our guide. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly. We have an obligation to be good citizens, an obligation to respect democracy, to respect our government, our elections, our law enforcement, and respect for the social contract that we share with other citizens. We cannot isolate ourselves in our own echo chamber with only those who agree listening. That's not communication. That is not the better conversation that we strive to teach at the Memorial Museum. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone surrender your deeply held beliefs. I only ask that you not forget that we are all in this great experiment together as fellow citizens of the greatest country ever known. Lincoln's words, for the people, by the people, of the people, also mean all the people. There is a breach in our country today, a division that must be healed. The book of Isaiah spoke about the breach that must be repaired. We must resolve to be as Isaiah asked us to be, repairers of the breach. Repair the breach. Hear Isaiah's words that, by the way, seem to describe Oklahoma City after the bombing. From the book of Isaiah, if the people will come together, their light will rise like the dawn out of darkness. 
Their cities will be rebuilt. They will raise the foundation for many generations and be called the repairer of the breach. And so today I lift up those words, the command of those words, that we should all seek to be repairers of the breach. We as a people must resolve that we repair the breach through kindness, respect, dignity, understanding, and better conversations. Repair the breach. That is the command we need to hear and consider for ourselves today. We hear a lot of talk these days about diversity. We must also celebrate how we are all the same in so many ways. Repair the breach. I close today with the words of Winston Churchill, one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century. He was giving a speech in his later years, and he closed the speech with these words. Never give up. And he turned to take his seat, and he sensed that the crowd did not receive his message. So he turned back to the podium, waited for there to be silence in the meeting room, and he said, never give up. Never, never, never. And he sat down, and his message was received, and I borrow it today. Never give up. Never give up on your dreams, your hopes, your happiness. Never give up on love, the goodness of people, the greatness of our country. Never give up on freedom, justice, kindness, and your faith. And never give up on yourself. Never. I pray today that you will have courage strength and wisdom, and that you have love and peace in your life forever and ever, world without end. Amen and amen. Justice Taylor, thank you for that inspiration and for a lifetime of public service that just keeps going. Thank you so much. The Oklahoma City Philharmonic's new album of The I Sing was commissioned to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the bombing and how far we've come. It was partially recorded before the pandemic and completed last season. It is set for worldwide release in two days on April 21st in music stores nationwide and across all streaming platforms. The involvement of the Philharmonic with the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum goes back to the days following the bombing in 1995 when First Lady Kathy Keating <coughs> invited the Philharmonic to perform at the first memorial service. A void was left on April 19, 1995, and we filled it with love. Performing Quintet for Brass by Michael Kamen, the brass players of the Oklahoma City Philharmonic. Please welcome them.
We come here to remember those at the Oklahoma Water Resources Board building. Trudy Jean Rigney. Robert N. Chipman. We remember those at the Athenian Building Job Corps. Catherine Elizabeth Ridley, Anita Christine Hightower, we remember rescue worker Rebecca Needham Anderson, we remember those who were killed in the Alfred P. Murrah building, federal building, U.S. Secret Service ninth floor. Alan G. Witcher. Kathy Lynn Seidel. Linda G. McKinney. Mickey B. Maroney. Donald Ray Leonard, Cynthia L. Brown, we remember our friends and family with the Drug Enforcement Administration, ninth floor, Kenneth Glenn McCullough, my daughter, Carrie Ann Lenz, and grandson, Michael James Lenz III, Rona Lynn Keener Chafee. Carol June Chip Fields. Shelley D. Bland.
We remember those who were killed with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, eighth floor. Clarence Eugene Wilson, Sr. Francis Fran Ann Williams. Michael D. Weaver. David Jack Walker. Jules A. Valdez. Leora Lee Sells. Lanny Lee David Scroggins. My father, Antonio Tony C. Reyes. Dr. George Michael Howard, DVM. Susan Jane Farrell. Kimberly K. Clark. Donald Earl Burns, Sr. David Neil Burkett. Peter R. Avilanosa. Ted L. Allen. We remember our friends and family with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, seventh floor. Joanne Wittenberg. John Carl Van Ness III. John Thomas Stewart. Terry Smith Rees. Patricia Ann Nix. Betsy J. B.B. McGonnell. James A. McCarthy II. Mary Leisure Renty. We continue to remember our friends and family with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, seventh floor. Teresa Lee Taylor Lauderdale. Ann Kreinberg. Tonson Eugene Jean Hodges, Jr. J. Colleen Giles. Linda Louise Florence. Judy J. Fro Fisher. Chastine Brooks Hearn Devereaux. Diana Lynn Day. Kim R. Cousins. Andrea Yvette Blanton. Diane E. Hollingsworth Allhouse. We remember our friends and family with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, fifth floor. Paul Gregory Beatty Broxman. We remember our friends of the U.S. Marine Corps recruiting sixth floor. Captain Randolph Guzman, USMC. Sergeant Benjamin Lorenzo Davis, USMC. We remember those with the U.S. Customs Fifth floor, Claude Arthur Medeiros, SSA. Paul D. Ice, Senior Special Agent. We remember 
our friends and family with the Department of Agriculture, fifth floor. Rita Bender Long. Carol Sue Khalil. Doris Adele Higginbotham. Richard Dick Cummings. Dr. Margaret L. Peggy Clark. James E. Bowles. Olin Burl Bloomer. We remember those with the U.S. Army Recruiting Battalion, fourth floor. Wanda Lee Watkins. Kayla Marie Titsworth. Dolores D. Stratton. My mother, Master Sergeant Victoria Vicky L. Son, U.S. Army. John C. Moss III. Peggy Louise Holland. Karen Gist Carr. Sergeant First Class Lola Bolden, U.S. Army. We remember our friends and family with the Department of Transportation, Federal Highway, fourth floor. John A. Youngblood. Johnny Allen Wade. Rick L. Tomlin. Michelle A. Reeder. Jerry Lee Parker. Ronata Ann Newberry Woodbridge. James K. Martin. Larry James Jones. Michael Carrillo. Mark Allen Bolte. Lucio Alleman Jr. We remember our friends and family with the Federal Employees Credit Union, third floor. Teresa Joe Mathis Wharton. Virginia M. Thompson. Victoria Jeanette Texter. My mother, Karen Howell Shepard. Sonia Lynn Sanders. Christy Rosas. Claudine Ritter. Jill Diane Randolph. Frankie Ann Merrill. Claudette Duke. Meek, Kathy Cagle Linen, Valerie Joe Kelch, Alvin J. Justice, Christy Yolanda Jenkins, Robin Ann Huff and baby, Amber Denise Huff. Linda Colleen Housley. Sheila R. Giger Driver, and baby, Gregory N. Driver II. <coughs> Jamie Falkowski Ginzer. Kathy a. Finley. Kimberly Ruth 
Burgess. Woodrow Clifford Woody Brady. We remember our friends and family from the Defense Security Service, third floor. Robert G. Westbury. Larry L. Turner. Norma Jean Johnson. Peter L. DeMaster. Harley Richard Cottingham. We remember our visitor on the second floor, Scott D. Williams. We remember our friends and family from the America's Kids Child Development Center, second floor, Colton Wade Smith. Chase Dalton Smith. Dominique Reve Johnson, London. My brother, Blake Ryan Kennedy. Wanda Lee Howell. Kevin Lee Gottschall II. Tevin DeAndre Garrett. Tyler Santoy Eves. Brenda Faye Daniels. JC Ray Coyne. Elijah S. Coverdale. Aaron M. Coverdale. Antonio and Sarah Cooper, Jr. Anthony Christopher Cooper, II. Dana Leanne Cooper. Zachary Taylor Chavez. Danielle Nicole Bell. Miss Bailey Allman. We remember our friends and family from the General Services Administration first floor. Michael L. Loudenslager. Stephen Douglas Curry. We remember our friends and family from the Social Security Administration first floor. Sharon Louise Wood Chestnut. W. Stephen Williams. Julie Marie Welch. Robert N. Walker, Jr. Luther H. Trainer. LaRue A. Trainer. Michael George Thompson. Charlotte Andrea Lewis Thomas. Emilio Tapia. Eula Lee Mitchell. Derwin W. Miller. Cartney J. McRaven. Rev Reverend Gilbert X. Martinez. 
Robert Lee Luster Jr. Aurelia Donna Luster. Airman First Class Lakeisha Richardson Levy. Raymond Lee Johnson. Jean Nutting Hurlbert. Dr. Charles E. Hurlbert. Thomas Lynn Hawthorne, Sr. We continue to remember our friends and family from the Social Security Administration first floor. Ronald Vernon Harding, Sr. Cheryl E. Hammond. Ethel L. Griffin. Margaret Betterton Goodson. Laura Jane Garrison. Mary Ann Fritzler. Don Fritzler. Ashley Megan Eccles. Catherine Louise Cregan. Gabriel D. L. Bruce. Peachland Bradley. My Aunt Carol Louise Bowers. Cassandra K. Booker. Olita C. Biddy. Paola Battle. Calvin Battle. Sandra G. Sandy Avery. Pamela Cleveland Argo. Richard A. Allen. Teresa Antoinette Alexander. Special thank you to all of our family members who are readers today. This is not an easy task. Please recognize all of our readers. The roots of the survivor tree will always be here on the sacred ground of the memorial, deeply rooted in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. Because others who experienced tragedy turned to the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum, the branches of the survivor tree are shading more survivors of more tragedies, creating a path towards healing, renewal, and hope for people around the world. Saplings of the Survivor Tree are available following today's ceremony in front of the museum. We are pleased that admission to the museum is free for everyone today as part of Cox Community Day. The museum will be open from now until 6 p.m. with the last entry at five o'clock. We invite you to join us next weekend as thousands from all 50 states in 12 countries come to Oklahoma City to run to remember. This celebration of life is something you should experience. Come out and honor those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. Cheer on our runners throughout the race course or meet them at the finish line to award them their medal. I guarantee you, you will be inspired. 
We invite all family members, survivors, and first responders to a reception inside the museum at 1030 after you've had time to spend at the chairs. Please enter through the 6th Street entrance. It's up to each of us to share this ever-relevant story of April 19, 1995, and how we as a community found hope following our darkest hour. Thank each of you for being part of this 28th Remembrance Ceremony. Thank you.